I'm very, very pleased to be here, but uh, what I have to say uh, might be hard on your ears, so please bear with me and uh, tolerate my belligerence. I have a slightly different uh, me message, uh, conversation to have with you. Uh, when Ada first invited me to speak, I said to her, are you sure you want me to speak? Because uh, I'm not sure that I fall into that category of uh, inspirational speakers, because uh, most of them bore me to death. Because um, usually they're telling lies. Uh, they're not actually saying anything that they believe in or actually understand. So I'm not your inspirational speaker. What I am, though, is a bit of a big mouth. So I will share with you a few things, but I can't claim to be an expert on anything. But I will share with you a particular view I have of the world, which many of you may not agree with, but I hope will slightly provoke you and make you angry. I am, however, not here to give you hope. Uh, everyone likes hope, but hope ain't a plan. We need a plan in the world we live in, so I'm going to slightly put some stuff out there and make you think. What I think is quite important is that uh, you all, particularly the, the younger, and I mean anyone sort of under 40, uh, come to terms with the reality of the world we live in, rather than sort of think that Facebook, Twitter, the internet is going to solve our problems. Uh, they aren't going to solve the problems, and you can't just hope. So what does make a difference really mean? Uh, how many of you know who actually coined the phrase, be the change? It was an Asian, actually. It was an Indian guy called Mahatma Gandhi. But I'm not going to use words like that, too. Um, because they are overused cliches, which again have become sort of escape routes for us to all feel good. Uh, so now at this point, some of you might be thinking, who is this negative guy? Why did they invite him? We all wanted to be uplifted. But, you know, this is not the black and white minstrel show. I'm not Louis Armstrong. I'm not going to play you a nice tune and make you all feel good on a Friday night. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I am very sorry uh, about that. Um, but what I do want to say is to confront you with some harsh realities about the world we live in. Uh, because the be the change, make a difference, etc., have become fads. They have become fashion. What CNN, going green, uh, superficial hubris, right? So that you can all feel good. Watch TV, cop out, get on your iPads and feel good. This isn't the world we live in, my friends. So now we have so much so that saving the world has become the part-time occupation of, of B-grade Hollywood actresses and actors. You know the type, right? Uh, don't adopt any white babies, only black babies, because they become good fashion accessories as well, and you care about Africa. So that's what the dumbing down has become, extreme. Now, I am slightly out there pushing it out, but I have got permission from one of my mentors who's here, who said, you can go out there. After all, you, you, on a Friday night, a bit of entertainment is also not bad. Okay, but now for the most serious stuff. Um, why are young people in Asia so confused? I, sus I subscribe to the notion that they're so, so confused because much of what they are taught has nothing to do with the world that they live in today. All right? Intellectually subservient to a Western narrative, they have all adopted a narrative that has got nothing to do with the world that they witness, feel, and live in on a day-to-day -day basis. For MAD, I think, those of you here who are, I think it's called mad ease, right? Uh, the thing that you all need to start doing is to move beyond the veneer of superficiality and feeling good about I care, about really asking the hard questions about the times that we, we live in. And that needs a very, very important and honest inquiry. One of the greatest risks of our times today in business, in political arenas, is intellectual dishonesty. Most business platforms, etc., that you would go to are intellectually dishonest. That horrible word, innovation, will appear everywhere. Use the word innovation, and it's supposed to explain everything. Ask them what they actually mean, and they can't tell you. Right? Innovation. So I have conferences where you are banned from using the word innovation. You cannot use the word. So language becomes important, and how we talk about these things become important. But intellectual honesty is the most important thing. 
So despite all the evidence that we have, that the narrative of the last two, three hundred years, which is essentially a Western narrative, at this point someone might think, oh, this guy is against white people. Please don't jump to such lazy conclusions. Uh, I am not anti-Western or anything, and I only have 20 minutes, but a Western narrative has essentially dominated the way we think about the world, even this part of the world. Uh, this is not an anti-colonial rant or anything like that, but it is a very important part of the awakening that needs to take place amongst the young in this part of the world. Most people in this part of the world, young people, don't even know the history of the last 50 years in this part of the world. If you ask them, if you ask them about the Vietnam War, they'll tell you that John McCain was a hero and Ho Chi Minh was a villain. Okay? So they don't even know. Today, if you read the newspapers, international newspapers, the narrative is essentially China bashing. China must be a threat. So you need to start thinking about all of this. Our best young minds go to schools where they are told that there is a certain business model called, I call it the Harvard, business, Harvard School business model, which seeks to externalize costs and yet says this is the one and only way to do things. We lose a whole generation of very good young kids from this part of the world to uh, old ideology. So what needs to change? So what I see and what I want to focus on for the remaining uh, 15 minutes is my view that the era of growth and exploitation that we are in at the moment can only be reshaped by reshaping capitalism in its extreme form and this can only take place in this part of the world. Not because, you know, Asians, Chinese, Indians are all superior human beings, but for one simple reason, too many. <laughs> too many. The weight is too many. So in 2050, there will be 9 billion people, give or take 100 million here or there. Okay, who's counting? 9 billion people, of which the majority of them will live in this part of the world. 9 billion people. And yet, at the same time, we are being told that we should all aspire to live like Americans. True? We should all aspire to do that. At the height of the financial crisis about three years ago, you will all remember that what were we in Asia told? You laggards, you cannot, you should stop saving. You should go out and spend. You remember? Use your credit cards. Be like Americans. Spend. And we thought, hey, this is our time. Two, three, two, three centuries of being subservient. Suddenly, we're the kings. Even the West is asking us to save the global economy. How good. So we all felt proud. Indians were jumping around saying, hey, now we are the Maharajas, for real. At the same time, you'll remember in 2010, as the run-up to, 2009, as the run-up to the Copenhagen Climate Change Conference. You all remember that? The same world leaders who were telling Asians to save, to, to stop saving and consume more, were saying, you Asians, you guys are responsible for climate change. All you, all you all Chinese and Indians now wanting to consume, you're polluting the world, da, 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 da. Now, no one connected the dots and said, hey, if you ask the Indians and Chinese to all consume to save the, to save the global economy, don't expect them to save the world. Simple equation. All right? If the Indians and Chinese aspire to consume like the average American, game over. All right? It's not rocket science. You don't need to be a denier. But the denial continues. So on one hand, we have, let's save the global economy, which is essentially to preserve the status quo of the dominance of Western economic model. And the other hand, to say to the Asians, you all consume more because, you know, investment banks and carry on, etc., and you might get a bit richer. On the other hand, at the same time, the conversation about environmental degradation. Of course, you all know that China gets bashed every day of the week. The good Indians don't get bashed because, you know, they're slightly democratic and the nasty commies must be the worst people on the planet, okay? So the commies get bashed, the good Indian Democrats who are actually consuming and rubbishing their own country more than anybody else cannot be criticized because they're Democrats. <laughs> and, you know, how can Democrats be wrong? So, what do we have? Absolute denial. And what are we told? That Asians must, do or must continue consuming. So I'll give you some examples of why we cannot go on this way. Let me take cars. Today there are about 800 million cars in the world. And in the West, the, the car populations are about 700 cars per thousand people. 750. China is already the world's largest car, pop, uh, car market in the world. Any Chinese want to guess how many cars per thousand people in China? About 150. Already the world's largest car market. India, car market, 
slow. How many cars in India per thousand people? About 50. Indians haven't even started driving. But the Indian government's got a good strategy to slow down car growth, which is bad roads. Okay? So, I, I, I am told that this strategy was not developed by McKinsey. Okay? Uh, so they got bad roads. So, now we're being told that, you know, the Chinese and Indians will become the world's largest car market. This is great for the global economy, etc., etc., because the car is the engine of growth. Okay. Now, if you know Chinese and Indians, and then you can lump in a 250 million Indonesians, you know, 50 million, uh, 50 million uh, Vietnamese, and, you know, soon we'll have the Burmese too having cars, God forbid. Uh, uh, you know how many cars there'll be in the world? About 3 billion cars. Now, most of you will know, but maybe most of you haven't traveled yet. The, I hope the students are poor enough that they haven't traveled. Um, but most of you will know that we, in, a, in most Asian cities, need more cars like I need a hole in my head. Or I, I, like I need a tumor in my groin. We don't need more cars. But that's what we're told we should have, more cars. This cannot happen. But the fiction is that somehow we will have green technology. We will have innovation, that somehow we'll have zero emission cars. Please, this is science fiction. Okay? Complete science fiction is Star Trek. It's Star Trek. Uh, Germany, most advanced automotive nation in the world. How many green cars? Less than 3,000. Ain't gonna happen. Okay? So we, now let's take just other forms of consumption. Let's take chickens. Chickens. Today, 350 million Americans eat 9 billion chickens. Try and imagine that. Don't get nightmares, not yet. Okay, 9 billion chickens. 3.5 billion Asians consume, 10 times the population, about 16 billion chickens. Now we're all told when we get richer, what do you do? You eat up the food chain, not down. If, three, three, if 5 billion Asians in 2050 start consuming meat like Americans, which is what we all aspire to, which is what the you know, progress is supposed to be, uh, guess how many chickens we'll be eating in 2050? 120 billion chickens. Now, I have no idea what that looks like. But I do get up at night sometimes thinking if there's a bird god that will release all the birds on the same day. They would darken the sky. They would shadow, they would block out the sun. The aeroplanes would drop off from the sky. And of course, they would poo on our heads. But this ain't going to happen. I mean, it sounds funny, but this isn't going to happen. But this is what we're told. So we are in total denial. What we do have, however, in this sort of broad basket of discussions about sustainability, that other horribly misused word, uh, is that somehow we will innovate. That some genius out of Silicon Valley or Bangalore or Shanghai will innovate. That the, the oceans will never be empty because we will be able to have tuna bread in petri dishes in laboratories. That we will have bioengineering. That the VCs who will invest in companies, how nice. We will save the planet, we will make money, everyone will be a billionaire. This is not going to happen. The truth is that billions of Asians will need to come to terms with the reality that they can't have it all. They cannot live like what they see on MTV. You know, the hood and then the, the crib. They can't have that all. A new reality that there have to be constraints. There will have to be limitations. The problem is that the best of our, uh, best of our young go to the business schools around the world to teach them that there are no limits that everything is possible because they are such bright sparks and they can innovate with technology and of course free markets and then lump it together with finance oh la, magic all the world's problems are solved all of us know this is a lie yet the narrative continues to be perpetuated in the media in forums like this dare I say at TED all the holy grail places where people refuse to acknowledge that the limits. Now people like me then come along and they say, ah, he must be angry, you know, uh, must be disillusioned, uh, doesn't really understand. Well, actually we do understand. And I, I like you all to understand. I'm not suggesting I have all the facts, right? Most of them, most of the time. But I am suggesting that you go out, especially the young people, and question the world that we have created and stop denying that the fact that limits will have to be imposed.
So I'd like in the last five minutes to talk about, so how do we do this? First one is, of course, to, start, stop, to, to stop being in denial, pretending that everyone, everything will be okay, just hoping for the best. I'm not suggesting you mustn't hope. You know, a little bit of hope is good, but we've got to have a plan. Okay, what will that plan look like? You have to, I think we'll have to revolve around three key things. The first one is that, recognizing that we live in a planet with resource constraints. This is not an environmental jargon. You know, I don't belong to green, green peas, I don't eat granola for breakfast, and I don't smoke pot. So I'm not some hippie, right? This is a real discussion about the political economy that we will be confronted with. Now, when I say this, people say, typically, well, why should we in Asia make all these sacrifices and not those in Europe or in the West? The re reason is quite simple. By 2050, the population of the West, including the United States, will be less than 10% of the world population. In a way, it becomes irrelevant. <laughs> I mean, it's irrelevant, okay? So, being, irre I mean, that's not to suggest I don't have good American friends and Danish friends, etc. I love them to death, okay? And if things get really serious, they can come and live with me. <laughs> but, but what I mean is, it's irrelevant what the political decisions are. The political decisions taken in this part of the world become the things that will shape the future of the 21st century. And the most important political decisions then will be around, what do you have a right to? I believe, and this is where some people then, you know, especially the, the Brahmins of the right wing, you know, the, the, the Brahmins who easily want to launch a jihad against people like me, <laughs> uh, will get really excited. I believe that, you know, car ownership, for instance, is not a human right. In fact, the ability to exercise that supposed human right to own a car collects a, creates a collective nightmare, which we have in most Asian cities. So they are, the issue will be the role of institutions. Institutions will become important. Now, if any of you believe that in the 21st century, in the most crowded part of the planet, we can have a free-for-all, libertarian, you know, utopian, tea party, Sarah Palin type of world, then dream on. But that is what we are being told. That is what supposedly freedom is. But we can't have that. Our freedoms will be different. I'll finish off by saying, therefore, we will need strong institutions. We will need rules. They will be almost draconian. That is inevitable. We are all need denying the inevitable. We can either prepare for that future now by being smart, rather than believing the lies of free market, democracy, and somehow all of that tied in with technology and innovation will create the future we want, or we can say those things are important, but we will have to live within limits and decide what those rules are going to be. For instance, we can't all own a car. Car ownership will have to be restricted. But critical to that, therefore, will be the pricing of resources. Today, most of the resources you and I use are underpriced. Why? Extreme capitalism, promoted through two, three centuries of Western sort of dominance of resources throughout the world, essentially underprices resources. The first attempt to underprice resources in a large scale was slaves. Natural resources, uh, human, human resources were underpriced. That was slavery. That was the founding basis for much of capitalism two, three centuries ago. I can go on, but we need to pre-price resources from water to, to, to fossil fuels, etc. But the most important thing we will need is, and this is where I get slightly controversial and my time's almost up, it will, we will need strong institutions. So what do I mean by strong institutions? We will need a strong state. The strong state will not be, as some people might jump to conclusions, me advocating fascist dictatorships, but we will need states that are, str states that are strong which are not usurped by private interests. So to today, for instance, uh, the great Barack Obama has done nothing to do nothing on carbon. Why? Because as soon as you need to be president of a country and you need a billion dollars to be president, your ability to do anything has been usurped. The state is weak. The state can't do anything. And so this is the kind of reality we need to confront in this part of the world. We will need to decide what are the rules of governance that we are going to embrace. The danger is that the ideological warfare being conducted through the international media, etc., continues to promote an ideology that freedom is somehow unrestricted, that we can have everything, 
and that we in Asia, this is our time to enjoy that unrestricted access to everything. This is not possible. My time's up. I'll shut up now and take a few questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>